Chapter Nine of Quintus Oakes, a Detective Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Quintus Oakes, a Detective Story, by Charles Ross Jackson. Chapter Nine: Distrust and Suspicion. The day following the murder of Winthrop Mark was one of uneasiness and dejection for the townspeople of Mona. The court scenes of the day before, and the great excitement caused by the discovery of the crime, had left their stamp. Disquietude was bred and nurtured by the crime itself, and the absence of clues save those of the arm. It was rumored and reiterated that Chief Holland had failed to discover the slightest evidence as to the perpetrator, and that the bullet even had remained unfound, as was most natural, but people look at things in a narrow light sometimes, and this was an occasion of deep trouble and much gossip for the town. The peculiar action of the negro, whom few had seen but all had heard, and who was pronounced a total stranger by those who had seen him, pointed strongly to him as the possible assassin. With his escape had come mutterings against Chief Hallen. Why had the courthouse not been watched? Where were the local authorities? Why had he been allowed to get away so easily? All these questions remained unanswered, for few stopped to think that there were no local detectives and only a few policemen. Then in the midst of these disgruntled thoughts and assertions appeared the mental picture of Clark, known in the town before, and now the most conspicuous man in it, towering above all in his active personality, as in his figure and sayings talk is cheap in such a place and talk has made or unmade many a man the great run of clark to the victim's side and the dramatic and terrible evidence he gave at the inquest was spoken of at first with awe and then with alarm to think he had gone to the mansion to spend a short time again gone to the place of all others that one should avoid at this time gone to the house where terror dwelt and at the end of whose grounds the murder had been committed Hallen, whose word was known to be law, had vouched for this. The personality of Clark stood silhouetted on the sky of lowering discontent. The only clue worth having was the one related to the arms of the murderer, and, given to the public, as it purposely had been by Clark in a moment of suspense, it had found deep rooting place in all minds. Who was the man with the great arms and with the blue cross on one of them? The left? Here was a small town, perhaps one thousand grown men. Who had the cross? Who? Might it be anyone? Yes, almost anyone. Did anyone know of such a scar? No, but who knew of his neighbor's arms? Who could vouch for his friend? So few had been associated, one with another, as boys. What of that? It was dying years ago. Suspicion was growing like a prairie fire, first a light that goes out, then flickers again and smolders, anon meeting resistance and apparently dying, but all the while treacherously gaining and advancing in the roots and the dry stubble below, then suddenly bursting into flame. With the first flame comes the inrush of air, then come the heat and the smoke and the low wall of fire, then the glare, the roar, and the conflagration sweeping all before it. So came suspicion to Mona, and friendship, respect, and brotherly love fled at its breath, as wild animals of the prairie flee before the advancing destruction. By evening of the second day the far-sighted and most influential citizens detected the conditions of affairs. The older residents had noticed a peculiar similarity of this murder to that of Smith. The coincidence of time and place was another factor. Could it be the same assassin? Had he dwelt with them all the while since? The most respected and wealthy of the inhabitants shared the unbelievable position of being under suspicion. There was no relief for anyone. The local newspapers published extras and could scarcely supply the demand. Uh. The murders of Smith and Winthrop were reviewed carefully, and their similarity much written about. The hotel and the two leading business streets were filled with suspicious, muttering groups. Nothing had been found missing of the dead man. His watch and money were untouched. His arrival by such an early train was not unusual. He frequently went to New York for an outing, and returned before breakfast to his magnificent place on the hill to the east of the town, where he lived with two old maiden aunts, his mother's sisters. 
now all his uneasiness and suspicion had been noted by hallen the chief he was a man who after living in the country for many years had finally pushed himself to the top of a large police force in a city of importance the physical strain had told on him however and now he found himself back in a small town recovered in health but shut in as to future prospects the murder of mark had come to him as a thunderbolt from a clear sky but he saw opportunities in it when oakes had visited him and made himself known he had at first been jealous but the former with his wonderful insight had made a friend of him hallen if you manage this affair well you will be famous they are looking for good men in new york all the while my work is in the mansion if our paths cross let us work together so had suggested oakes he had known about hallen as he knew the history of all police officers and had thus given hope to the man who had been used to better things instantly hallen had seen that to antagonize oakes would be foolish to aid him and perhaps obtain his advice and friendship would ultimately redound to his own future credit and possibly advancement for oakes work had brought him in contact with police heads in all the large cities his boldness and genius for ferreting out mysteries were known to them all and they paid him the compliment of studying his methods carefully hallen had agreed to have oakes testimony at the inquest taken at just the proper moment for effect and had agreed to call dr moore as an expert of course the coroner did what the chief said as oakes had said if you want expert advice get it from moore if you don't ask him you won't get it in mona the idea of oakes bringing in his testimony as he did was part of the plan to watch the audience the planning of the chief and himself had accounted for the somewhat informal presentation of the evidence that i had noticed in rural courts affairs are not conducted as they are in the city and i had observed a quick swing to affairs hardly accounted for on the ground of practice i recognized the hand of quintus oakes and knew that the scene had been carefully manoeuvred hallen sat in his office on the evening of the day after the inquest reviewing the happenings that had crowded so fast in mona and thinking not without misgivings of the wave of suspicion that was rising to interfere with the affairs of the town at this moment the editor of the mona mirror entered a whole-souled fat individual breezy and decidedly agreeable he was one of the natives a man of growing popularity and decided education dowd was his name and he hated that fellow skinner who edited the rival newspaper the daily news skinner had bossed things in a free-handed fashion until dowd a clerk in the post office until middle life had decided to enter the field of journalism less than two years before dowd was inexperienced but he was bright and he wielded a pen that cut like a two-edged sword and the love that was lost between the two editors was not worth mentioning as dowd entered and found hallen alone he took off his hat and overcoat and laughed sarcastically he really liked hallen and was on intimate terms with him hallen looked up well what's ailing you now he said oh nothing only this town is going loony sure as fate hallen what are you going to do hallen chewed the end of a cigar viciously i'm going to do the best i can to solve the mystery if i cannot do it i can at least keep order here give me a few specials and the necessity and i will make these half-crazy people do a turn or two the burly chief turned the conversation into other channels, but Dowd was satisfied. He knew the speaker well. End of chapter 9《Quintus Oaks, A Detective Story》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Arnie Horton. Quintus Oakes, A Detective Story by Charles Ross Jackson. Chapter 10 The Cellar. Meantime, our first experience at the mansion, previously recorded, bade fair to be a serious one. When Oakes had collapsed on his return from the cellar, Dr. Moore fortunately was sufficiently recovered to reach his side in a few seconds elevate his feet stone he'll be all right in a few minutes he has fainted i did as directed and more threw the half of a pitcher of water 
on the unconscious man's neck and face. Gravity sent the blood back to his head, and when the water touched him, he gasped and presently opened his eyes. Then we carried him to the bed. In an instant he attempted to rise, but the doctor refused to allow it, giving him instead an enviable drink from his flask. Keep your guns by you, said Oakes, and give me mine. The tension had told on me, and Moore was now by far the best man. He smiled and ordered me to take a drink also and to sit down. I obeyed, for I felt, after the excitement, as limp as a boy after his first cigar. Dr. Moore was examining Oakes' head. Fine scalp wound, said he, and proceeded to sew it up and dress it. His pocket case came in handy. He had been wise to bring it. Hurt anywhere else, old fellow? asked he. No, sore as the devil all over, that's all. And Oakes arose, took off his coat, and began to bathe his face. Keep an eye on that door, said he. I was myself now, and took my chair to the hall door, sitting where I could command the head of the stairs, and could also hear anyone who might approach from below. What happened? asked Moore. Well, nothing very much, said Oakes. Only I guess I got a mighty good licking. You look it, said I. Did you shoot for help? Yes, I did. I could not shout. The shots saved my life. How? Did you kill anyone? Don't know. Only the other party kindly quit killing me when I began to shoot. I heard something drop, however, and there may be a dead body somewhere. The shots had aroused the household, and we heard shouting and cries from the cooks and from Annie. Soon they appeared, hunting for us, all distraught and frightened. They said they were in the kitchen when they heard the shots, and did not know whence they came. This was probable, as the cellar was away from their section. Annie cried when she saw Oakes, and ran out to bring in more help. One of the gardeners returned with her, and as he came into the room I received the impression of a silent, stern-looking man, past forty and rather strong in appearance, although not large. He had seen better days. Ah, said he, ye have run up against it again, sore. It's nerve ye have to go nigh that room after what ye got last time. Oakes looked at me and at Moore, and we saw he wished us to keep silent. Yes, I shan't try it again in a hurry. What's your name, he asked. The question came quick as a flash. I knew he was trying to disconcert the fellow. My name is Mike O'Brien, sir. Gardener, you remember? Twas me that helped you last time, sir. You mean you stood by and let the others help me, Mike? We knew now that this was the indifferent gardener of whom Oakes had spoken. Through for ye, sir. Twas little enough I did, and that's a fact. I'm not used to being scared to death like ye be, sir. Was that an unintentional shot, or was it a feeler? Oakes had a sharp customer before him, and he knew it. Where were you when you heard the shots, Mike? In the woods, at the front of the house. I was raking up the leaves, be the same token. What did you see? Oakes spoke in a commanding voice and fingered the breech of his revolver in a suggestive way. I seen a shadow come out of the cellar door. What door? The only cellar door, near the side of the house, sir. What sort of shadow? Twas the shadow of a man, and a big one. The sun cast it on the side of the house, sir. Oakes thought a moment, then arose and said, Step here, Mike, and point out the side of the house you mean. Mike hesitated. The other servants withdrew at Oak's suggestion that he wished to talk with the gardener. The latter advanced. We felt that Oakes was trying to spring a trap. The side of the house where the cellar door is, reiterated Mike. Nonsense, O'Brien, your story is impossible. The sun was then in the east, 
and the shadow would have been thrown on the east wall. There is no door on that side. It is on the west side of the house. O'Brien looked at Oakes defiantly. You're entirely wrong, sir. There is the cellar door to the east. He pointed to a hatch opening about forty feet from the house near the well. The door ye saw on the west is never open. Tis nailed up. The tables were turned. Oakes was disconcerted. If what you say is true, you have my apology. I have not investigated closely. So I thought, sir, was the answer, and we all wondered at the amazing coolness and self-possession of the man. It was one against three, and he had held his own. Sit down, Mike, said Oakes. How long have you been here? Only a matter of six weeks. I came from New York and tried for a job. Maloney, the head man, give me one. Where is Maloney? He was in the tool house when I come by, sir. He didn't hear the commotion, being sort of deaf. All right, Mike, stay where you are a moment. Then Oakes turned to us. Just after Moore was attacked, I heard a sound like a quick footstep, and having certain suspicions of my own, made a dash for the cellar. I found there was no cellar under the north wing, but toward the west and directly beneath the dining room was a door. As I opened it, all was dark, but my eyes soon accustomed themselves to the light, and I made out a good-sized chamber and what I took for a man near the farther end. I remained silent, pretending I had seen nothing, and closing the door, made a movement back up the cellar stairs. There I waited for about five minutes. The ruse worked. The door of the chamber opened, and a man dressed in a dark cloak and a mask partly emerged, and, I thought, started for the other stairs at the west end of the cellar. I jumped and grappled with him, but he struck me with the butt end of a revolver, and I was dazed. In another minute he was punishing me severely. I fired two shots, then he threw me away from him and disappeared. He was stronger than anyone I ever met, said Oakes, apologetically, a regular demon, and he got in the first blow. I think I wounded him, however. What shall we do, said Moore. Go quickly and investigate, was the answer. Here, Mike, you lead the way. Mike did not hesitate. If playing a game, he did it well. Want a gun, said Oakes. No, sore. Not if yous all are armed. Guess we can give him all the scrap he wants. We descended the stairs, Oakes last, as became his condition. He touched Moore and myself and pointed to Mike. Watch him. He may be already armed, he whispered. The cellar was lighted by one window at the western end. A door at the same end, which evidently led to some stairs, was padlocked and, as Oakes said, had not been recently opened. The dust lay upon it undisturbed, and the padlock was very rusty. This corroborated Mike's story. The door above that opened on the ground. It was boarded up, he said. No means was found of passing beneath the dance hall, as Oakes had said. From the lay of the ground, we concluded that the cellar was very low there and not bottomed, a shut-in affair such as one finds in old buildings of the colonial epoch. Across the cellar to the other side, the south, the same thing pertained except at the western extremity under the dining room. There a door opened into a cellar room or chamber. Here, take this, said Oakes, handing Mike a small pocket taper. Light it. Mike did as told and stepped into the room. I after him. Oakes held the cellar door open, and I, happening to look at him, saw that he was watching Mike as a cat watches a mouse. He had dropped a match at the moment, and, with his eye still on the gardener, stooped to pick it up. His hand made a swift double movement. He had the match and something else besides, but Mike had not observed, 
and I, of course, said nothing. The room was low and without windows, but the air was remarkably clean and fresh. Plenty of ventilation in here, said I. Yes, and blood, too, said the gardener. Sure enough, the floor was spattered with it. Mine, I guess, said Oakes. Moore, kindly fetch a lamp from upstairs. Ask Annie for one. Moore went and soon brought down a small lantern. We could hear Cook's voice at the head of the stairs. Also his wife's and Annie's. It was the long-expected hunt that no one had ever before made, and which might clear up the mystery at any time. By the better light we saw evidences of the struggle that had taken place, a strip of oak's coat, and a piece of glazed red paper, an inch or so long, and perhaps half as broad, white on one side, red on the other. Piece of a mask, said I, and oak's placed it in his pocket. Dr. Moore walked to the east side of the room, where he and I saw a door in the wall, and some plastering on the floor under it. Mike was busy examining a heap of rubbish at the other end. His conduct had been most exemplary. Moore turned the light on the door, and we three observed it for a moment. Mike had not seen it distinctly, if at all. Moore, come here, said the detective, retreating and the doctor followed with the light. Come on, Stone. I left the room with them. Curious, he heard Mike say behind us. What is curious? asked Oakes. The smart hired man answered, Mr. Clark, the air is good in here. Where does it come from? I guess we have learned all we need this time, Mike, was the reply, and the gardener came out reluctantly. Oakes had seen the door in the wall. It was all he wanted to know. He closed the outer entrance of the room and called to Cook for hammer and nails. The man brought them quickly. Then the leader took a board that was standing against the wall, and Mike and Cook nailed it across the door from frame to frame. Mr. Clark, ye will have the devil now, sore, said Mike. Oakes took a pencil out of his pocket and wrote Clark on one end of the board then with a single movement continued his hand over its edge carefully and on to the frame where the line terminated in a second signature clark anyone removing that board has got to put it back to match that line said oakes and that with a board is practically impossible where nailing has been done now for the exit that opens near the wall we went back through the cellar hall and found at the east end a door ajar. It did not lock and was hung on rusty hinges. Beyond was a dark passage. Where does this lead, Mike? To the opening by the well, sir. How do you know? I don't know myself, but Maloney said the outside opening by the well led into the cellar. Cook says so, too. Tis a passage they used in wet weather, sir. Mike, you and Cook go round and guard that outer door by the well. Open it. I'm going through. Mr. Clark, don't go in there alone. I'll attend to that, said Oakes. You go with Cook. The two went to the well and lifted the hatch door. As they did so, Oakes held a lighted match inside one end of the tunnel. It blew strongly toward us. The air was rushing in, and we knew the passage led to the opening. We heard their voices calling to us. Dr. Moore spoke. Oaks, you shall not go in there. You have done enough today. You are a wounded man. I caught up the lantern and my revolver, and Moore followed. Hold on, said Oaks. You are in the most dangerous part. Don't be rash. Here, Stone, you go first, and Moore, you follow about ten feet behind, without a light in order that you may be undetected. Take matches. I'll stay here with the taper and watch. When you get to the other end, don't go up the steps leading to the ground until both Mike and Cook show themselves. We know nothing about them, you know. Be cautious. The man we want went out this way, whoever he is. I threw the light ahead and advanced some ten feet. I heard more following. 
careful said he in a whisper again i threw the light ahead and beheld only the walls of the square tunnel i could hear the breathing of moore behind me i knocked on the wall here and there with my revolver it rang true and solid we gradually advanced until we beheld the daylight and saw the men waiting at the head of the stone steps i ascended moore took the lantern and called back to oakes addressing him as clark in a moment he came stay where you are stone said he to me come here mike mike descended willingly enough i watched cook and looked all around open that door oakes pointed to a little wooden opening in the side of the stairs mike obeyed but instantly closed it again with a bang a man said he oakes and moore leveled their revolvers come out said the detective or take the consequences i shall shoot mike opened the door again hiding his figure behind it for protection as it swung out i expected to see someone shot but moore threw the light in and instantly oakes dived forward into the alcove of stone we could hear him chuckle cook at my side was standing on one leg in his excitement then dr moore burst into laughter what is it what's the matter i cried i could not see very well and ran halfway down oakes was standing beside moore trying to look grave in his hand was a red paper mask and a long black robe o'brien looked on his eyes twinkling but his face serious i'm thinking it's lucky mr clark sore that ye saved your ammunition said he yes retorted oakes and it's still more fortunate you're a good actor o'brien's somewhat insolent manner changed instantly to one of civility and oakes turned to us no wonder some said there was a woman in this affair then he ordered the hatch door nailed down and handed the things to me please take these upstairs stone we must investigate this more fully and we withdrew to discuss our findings what do you think of o'brien oakes i asked he seems to be a cool sort of customer yes he is no ignoramus he's a shrewd fellow and a deep one but i have learned a few things end of chapter ten of quintus oakes a detective story this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org quintus oakes a detective story by charles ross jackson the night walk events were following each other rapidly at the mansion after leaving the cellar oakes led us back through the grounds around the south side of the house there was no entrance to the cellar there apparently when we reached our rooms and i had deposited the mask and gown on my table oakes turned to the caretaker cook who accompanied us you have been several years here have you not yes mr clark when did the trouble first begin about three years ago sir following some repairs that were made after mr odell mark bought this place from his brother what do you know of those repairs well sir as perhaps you noticed the door from the dining room to the parlor opens on a short hall about three feet deep now sir mr odell mark had a wall thickened between the rooms he thought it was weak and this hall represents the thickness of the wall. Oak stood at the window, his hands in his pockets, looking out. Did you see that wall being built yourself, Cook? I didn't notice particularly, sir. Well, Stone, we'll try the simplest theory first. Will you kindly go with Cook up to the roof and look around carefully? I have an idea the wall is doubled and that you will find an opening up there somewhere we went and as oakes had surmised soon found a small opening like a chimney 
grated in solidly and protected by a covering and so reported good said oakes the wall is double in part at least and the opening was carried into the cellar room and a door placed there what for said i perhaps to ventilate it we may find some other reason we seem to be solving the mystery was moore's comment oakes looked at him quizzically are you satisfied doctor that there is a physical agent at work here moore grew red certainly he said and quintus smiled i thought probably you would be convinced in time a thorough licking is an excellent argument it is my belief that the escapes were made through that double wall and that we shall find some movable panels in the dining room but the motive we are strangers we gave no provocation i cried we have yet to learn the motive also why a man should wear a robe the mask is sensible enough but why he impeded himself with a robe is beyond us as yet it would hide his body to be sure as the mask would hide his face but it would certainly greatly affect his chances of escape if pursued cook why was there no investigation ever made before i don't know sir mr odell was very timid did you ever go through the tunnel to the well yes sir i used to go before the mystery began but never afterward how about the place in the stairs where the rope was found that was always there sir and used for gardener's tools then the gardener knew of it maloney the older one did i'm sure he did he has been here a long time was he here before the mysteries yes sir he has been five years on this place cook what do you think of the murder of winthrop mark it was one of those sudden questions that sometimes brings results i don't know sir it's terrible sir of course where was maloney yesterday cook the man looked long at us he was here when i got up at six o'clock raking the leaves on the front indeed said oakes we could not tell whether the answer surprised him or not i suppose mike worked all day yes sir he was about on the place the entire time quintus oakes made no remark whatsoever at this but dismissed cook we cannot go too far in presence of the servants said he for i am only clark the agent here you remember the time is coming where we might have to declare ourselves and we may need police to help make arrests but he smiled we have helen as a friend i guess oakes was calmly sanguine i could see but of course he did not know that the collateral events were brewing of grave importance to us all now for the robe and mask said he i handed over the mask an old affair and considerably worn from usage a piece of it was missing which oakes replaced with a fragment of paper picked up in the cellar it fitted exactly settling the fact that the mask had been worn by the man who fought him in that place the detective looked it all over and said this is such as was sold in new york years ago it is ordinary and offers no clue as to the owner of the place of purchase i know the kind the robe was fairly long and made of old velvet lined with satin quite shiny inside and out the name of its maker had been carefully cut away it was spotted with blood oaks no doubt for it was fresh it served a good purpose this time anyway said i save the man's clothes from being marked medium chest measure said oaks try it on stone i did so and it just met around me good the fellow who wore it is not a giant in chest measure at all events though larger than you probably since he wore it next to his undershirt how in the world do you know that oakes said the doctor look at the discoloration of the lining on the shoulders and also across the chest and back 
the soil is old but there is a moisture about the front yet the moisture of fresh perspiration it has been used quite recently that would not have come through a coat or a vest i should not be surprised if he had worn it over his naked chest where do you suppose the outfit came from i ask probably a relic of some masquerade ball of many years ago this house used to be a popular place for entertainments what did you pick up in the cellar when you stooped for the match oh you noticed that see for yourselves and he showed us an old-fashioned heavy caliber cartridge and how about the closet in the steps from which you took the robe i pursued i happened to see the door although both of you missed it the person who hid the disguise there is quite familiar with that exit evidently that narrows the search considerably said oakes but the robe is a mystery it is a senseless thing to use under such circumstances yes senseless that is the word spoke up more oakes eyes searched the physicians but the latter made no further remark i thought oakes was sizing him up as pretty far from senseless himself we now examined the robe more carefully and saw that it was soiled with what appeared to be soot oakes shook his head no it seemed to be wood ash of some kind see how light some of it is he said he ran his hand along the inside of the robe and found a small well-worn slit an opening to a deep pocket instantly he turned it inside out and a small roll of paper dropped from it he carefully unfolded it and spread it on the table it is a piece of old newspaper he said it has been read much it has been thumbed till it is ready to fall apart read it stone your eyes are best i studied a while and then began daily news october thirtieth eighteen nine the body was found downward on the main highway just below the crest of the mona hill it was first seen by john horney who was going to the reservoir in advance of his gang of laborers they were in sight when he discovered it the time was therefore shortly before seven the men were going to work at six thirty from mona they recognized it instantly as the body of orlando smith our beloved and esteemed citizen death had occurred only a short time before and the murder must have been done about daybreak it was evident that mr smith was returning from his factory when he had spent the night the shift having been doubled recently owed to the pressure of business later examination showed that the bullet entered the chest and was from a large revolver a forty four or forty five caliber the ball was not found we are unable to give any more particulars now before the time of going to press that is all i said we remained standing while we thought over the matter there was a satisfied air about the detective that i could not quite fathom and dr moore seemed to be quite pleased also well what is it i ask with a voice that betrayed traces of elation oakes answered me the man in the cellar wore this robe if he thumbed this paper the murder of smith interest him the murder of mark was similar and i believe our mansion affair is going to involve us in a peck of unexpected trouble the clues are showing now and we must know more about the smith murder as well as the mark affair yes put in more and all about the suspected motives in the smith affair oakes smiled don't be too previous my boy if holland looks for our help well and good otherwise remember i have given my word not to interfere with this search at present meanwhile we must get into town and look around you must remain here said moore you cannot go out until that wound begins to heal in a day or so that is so said oakes but perhaps stone can find out what is going on 
so it was arranged that i should call on chief hallen that evening and spend a few hours in mona at supper oakes said that tomorrow he would have men from the city who would make a complete search of the walls and perhaps tear down some partitions masons and other workmen you know he said i saw a twinkle in his eyes and realized that he was going to surround himself with men in a case of emergency are you expecting trouble i asked no he said grave again in a second but i believe in being forearmed this matter is capable of developing into a very serious affair for all hands especially if we have a band of conspirators against us a band said i yes certainly has it never occurred to you that there may be several desperate characters in this affair and the murder this is no boy's play and we're facing unknown dangers now stone go about town carefully and send this cipher to new york first thing when you come back tell chief helen i want you escorted to the mansion by two men remember he will understand for he spoke to me of the advisability of giving me aid it all seemed strange to me but i was not fearful when i left just at seven for the town i took the short cut over the bridge and up the hill beyond and they watched me as i crossed the rolling plains to mona it was a clear night and i could see well over the hills the three-quarters moon giving me excellent light i could not help thinking how careful was this man oakes what a peculiar nature was his alert severe even to austerity at times then solicitous friendly and even fond of a joke i was more glad that i came although i realized that perhaps it was foolish to interfere in such affairs of course that murder of mark had been cast upon our notice by curious circumstances and unexpectedly as i walked over the rolling ground i kept my eyes well upon my surroundings but not a living thing did i see except myself and the night birds until i entered the town there was an air of subdued excitement about the place as i walked to the post office to send my dispatches the loungers seemed numerous and some were amiss in their greetings others whom i knew approached in an affable manner enough but there seemed no genuine friendliness the telegraphed manager took the cipher and smiled when he saw it then he said to me in a whisper tell mr clark there is trouble comin to my look of surprise he answered oh that's all right i had a visit from your friend before he went to the mansion again i recognized the work of careful oaks and understood why he did not hesitate to send the cipher a thing unusual in a small town the indications of impending trouble in town were quite impressive to me the little hotel at the center of a lounging crowd large and composed of representative men as well as the usual hangers-on there were evidences of much interest around the police building also much more than would occur under normal circumstances in a town of this size and even more than was present the night before i noticed a couple of brawls in considerable raising of voices many men were walking about as though watching the others the prairie fire had been lighted the sparks were burning near the roots of the grass the air was uneasy ready to rush in as wind to fan and feed the first flame i visited the chief who was with his subordinates he invited me into the private room and then said mr stone i am doing all that i can to detect this murder and to satisfy the public demand for his apprehension but the clues are practically worthless the populace is uneasy and suspicious then he detailed to me all that he knew i then told him how the people's actions had impressed me i am going to have all i can to keep order i am going to ask your friend oakes to take a hand he will do it i said for he is greatly interested 
it is for the welfare of the town which i serve that i ask him to join me in this matter go to him and tell him i shall see him in the morning if possible i was glad that the affairs were taking such a turn for i knew the facts in our possession and that oakes's counsel would be valuable i then requested an escort of two men to accompany me on my return to the mansion as oakes had suggested certainly i had no intention of letting you go back alone he said and then he summoned two of his men clad in citizens clothes and introduced them to me now take a walk to the outskirts and return the same way by which you came my men will follow you a short distance before i left i noticed my companions fine-looking fellows both of them and saw the tell-tale pouching of the hip pockets and knew that we were all well armed in order not to attract attention we will walk some distance behind you we will keep you within sight and hearing if we fire a shot return to us i started across the rolling country and saw two figures behind me why were they so careful why did they not accompany me they separated and we advanced i myself following the narrow path the night was still i halted occasionally and looked back a dim figure would halt on my left and on my right it was lonesome but i felt i had company i neared the slope to the pond and looked around there was nothing visible and i began to descend with an easy stride although nearing the mansion i felt an unaccountable dread this was the trying part of the journey and my followers were now invisible to me being on the plain above the crest of the hill i gripped my revolver firmly and stepped rapidly on to the bridge but as i did so i heard a pistol shot from above and knew instantly that i was in danger that my companions had signalled me to return i faced about and commenced my descent of the hill from somewhere a near voice came to me clearly run for your life it said i could see nothing but it retreated hurriedly and was soon with the others at the top of the hill why did you tell me to run i panted they looked at me we said nothing was the answer we merely signaled you to come back well someone ordered me to run for my life ah they said we thought we heard a voice we saw a figure at the other side of the pond we came over the crest cautiously and he did not expect us he was crossing in a range of the light from the mason gate when we detected him so much for following you well but who spoke to me he could not have done so his voice would not have sounded so near no evidently someone near you was watching him he was about to waylay you and the watcher knew it and warned you we heard a commotion and saw a figure dash from the bridge away toward the north end of the pond and disappear then another figure showed at the crest on the river pond and followed him at breakneck speed see the man on the bridge was the fellow who warned you the other is after him he won't catch him however come i cried and we darted down and over the bridge to the road above but nothing was visible suddenly a couple of figures emerged from the darkness by the mason gate we recognized oakes and moore who had been awaiting us we related the circumstances of our return to the mason to them yes said oakes we were watching the man near the road he had a gun and was evidently waiting for you we were just going to make a rush at him when we saw you run back at the signal who was he asked i i will answer the question by asking who was the man who warned you i haven't the least idea said i you see you were in great danger and only that man's foresight saved your life but there are two unknowns now the friend and the enemy we watched my escorts descend and cross the bridge mount the ascent and disappear over the crest toward mona 
the moonlight silhouetted their figures for an instant as they turned and waved a farewell end of chapter eleven twelve of quintus oaks a detective story this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Quintus Oaks, a detective story by Charles Ross Jackson. Chapter 12. The Witness. Mr. George Elliot, aristocratic, well-to-do clubman and all-round agreeable fellow, lived in bachelor apartments on the Upper West Side of New York. He was engaged now in the brokerage business, but, time having been dull, he found it rather difficult to occupy himself, and was anticipating taking a vacation, but where he had not yet decided. Events were shaping themselves, however, to bring him into the happenings at Mona as one of our party. On the corner, near the apartment, was a boot-blacking stand presided over by one Joe, an intelligent and wide-awake coloured youngster, whose general good nature and honesty had made him popular with many. Among his patrons and general well-wishers was Mr. Elliot, to whom Joe had taken a particular liking, and whose opinions the young negro had often sought in an off-hand way, for, despite his general air of reserve and hauteur, Elliot was kindness itself at heart, and a man who could be easily approached by those who were suffering from worry and hardship. At about the time of the beginning of this story, Joe's mother had been taken sick and had died in Troy, and the boy had gone up there for a few days. Then he had gone to Lorona, a little town farther south, and from thence to Mona on his way home to New York. At Mona he had seen a terrible thing, a murder. Bewildered, frightened, overawed by his fateful knowledge, he had managed, however, to reach New York, where he sought out Mr. Elliot for counsel. He knew the latter was kind and good and would tell him what to do. Joe realised that he needed advice, that he was in a terrible fix, being the only witness, so far as he knew, of a crime of the worst kind. As Joe told Mr. Elliot the things he had witnessed, that gentleman realised the tremendous value of the evidence being told him. By adroit questioning, he determined that the celebrated Quintus Oakes was in Mona. The boy said he recognised him, for he had frequently shined Mr. Oakes's shoes in times past on Broadway. Elliot realised that as he was called Clark at the inquest, according to Joe, the people in Mona did not know him as Oakes. He must be travelling under an alias, on important business probably. Elliot also grasped the fact that Oakes was there at the time of the murder by coincidence only. He had read of the affair in the evening paper, but only in a careless manner. It was all of deep interest now. What should he do with Joe? If he allowed the boy to think that he was in a tight place, he might run away, and that would defeat justice. There was the alternative of telling the police. That would mix himself up in an unpleasant affair, and Joe might not be believed might be falsely accused of the murder. Again, he knew Mr. Oakes. He had seen him at the club, and he did not desire to frustrate whatever investigations the detective might be making. The best solution would be to find Quintus Oakes and tell him. He certainly would be able to give some attention to the murder, even if not in Mona for that purpose. Meanwhile, he himself would hold the boy at all hazards. With skills scarcely to be expected from one of his easy-going type, he told Joe to remain and sleep in his flat that night, and that he would fix things for him. The terror-stricken negro was only too glad of sympathy and protection from one of Mr. Elliot's standing, and complied, for he was at the mercy of his friends. What could he, a coloured boy, do alone? After tired nature had asserted herself, and Joe had fallen asleep in a room which had been given him, Elliot called up Oakes's office by telephone. In less than an hour, a dapper young man sought admission to the apartment and was met by Elliot. He introduced himself as Martin from Oakes's place. In a few words, Elliot explained matters and Martin said, Let Joe go to his boot-blacking stand in the morning. 
get your shoes shined, and place your hand on his shoulder in conversation, so that he can be identified before you leave. Our men will be in sight. Then meet me at the elevated station, and we will go to Mona together, if you care to do so. Good, said Elliot. I am willing. I will take my vacation that way. And that was how, several hours later, Joe went to his boot-blacking stand, feeling secure in being near friends, and oblivious of the fact that strange eyes were watching all his movements. A little later, Elliot patronized the stand, and in leaving, placed his hand on Joe's shoulder and said, Nobody will trouble you, old fellow. Don't say a word. It will all come out right. I will back you to the limit. And after that, several pairs of eyes watched every movement of the boot black. Several affable strangers gave him quarters for ten-cent shines. Joe was not in the police net, but he was in the vision of those silent men whom one cannot detect, those experts employed by men like Oakes. Escape was impossible for the Negro. Joe remained in good spirits, for had not Mr. Elliot befriended him? He was ignorant of the doings of those brief hours when he slept. Elliot's going to Mona was perhaps unnecessary, but he felt a natural curiosity to know Oakes better, as well as to see the outcome of the case and the effect of the evidence the Negro possessed. He was also actuated by a desire to do all he could to establish the accuracy of the boy's statement, and to see that he obtained as good treatment as was consistent with the ends of justice. He and Martin arrived at Mona the day after the murder, our first one at the mansion. The two stayed at the hotel and studied the town, finding it impossible to go to the mansion without creating talk. As Martin said, we must go slowly and not appear too interested in Oakes, or rather Clark, as he is known up here, so the office informed me. So far as we know, he has nothing to do with the murder case, and we, being strangers and consequently subject to comment, must be guarded in our actions. I have seen and heard enough to realise that there is much suppressed excitement among the people. We must communicate with Oakes quietly, and find whether it is wise to see him. He may not desire our presence at the Mark Place. End of chapter 12《of Quintus Oakes, a Detective Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Quintus Oakes, a Detective Story by Charles Ross Jackson. A Plan of Campaign. Next day, as we were at breakfast at the mansion, the masons and carpenters came. Curiously enough, one of them brought a note from Martin, asking if it would be convenient for him to bring a stranger, with valuable information, to see Mr. Oakes that morning. And the man found it convenient to drop into town a little later, and incidentally to meet Martin, and let him know that Oakes expected him. Then he went to the hardware store and bought a few trifling things, as any carpenter or mason might do. Looks as though I'm going to hold a reception this morning, said Oakes. The chief of police making an engagement last night for an interview this morning, and now Martin asking for another. What is Martin doing up here? asked Moore. Well, don't get impatient. He has something important anyway. Just wait. I think Moore felt aggravated at Oakes' apparent indifference. Of course, it was simulated but he seemed so calm and oblivious of the mass of happenings that had put Moore and myself in a state of extreme excitement. It was not long before Martin and Mr. Elliot were with us. Oakes received Elliot in a most agreeable manner, which placed us all at ease. He said he knew Mr. Elliot by sight, and esteemed it greatly that he should extend information to him. Also, he was sure it must be of great value, since the gentleman had travelled all the way from New York to place him in possession of it, and this was said before any information was given. We saw that our friend was a diplomat. Quickly Mr. Elliot gave all the particulars of the Negro's confession, and the detective said, If I am called into the case by Chief Holland, 
i want to see the boy if not the information should be given to the chief as the matter belongs to his jurisdiction looking out of the window at that moment i espied holland coming up the walk good said oakes now mr elliot will you kindly retire with dr moore while stone martin and i hear what the chief has to say when holland came up he seemed very cordial but worried and made no attempt to disguise the fact that he anticipated trouble with the unruly element in mona by saturday night you see he said we are few here and i have been kept busy with the brewing uneasiness in town and cannot handle the murder affair satisfactorily i have come to ask you to help me if you are sufficiently at leisure we cannot get any clues at all save that the man was killed by a bullet of large caliber in the hands of a good shot as the distance from which it was fired would seem to show the world has been searched but nothing found the crowd that went with you to the dying man's side trampled away all clues on the ground my men have reported to me the curious affair of last night continued the chief i suppose you have an explanation for it in any event it must be followed up the people must be diverted and more must be done at once than i can do will you help me yes said oakes of course hello what ails your head said the chief after thanking him and then oakes told him as much as was necessary of the events of the day before i am very glad your carpenters have arrived said the chief they may help he smiled as did oakes they understood one another they were in similar lines of business now that i have a hand in this thing let's get all acquainted said oakes and he called in more and elliot and the discussion became general elliot was admitted unreservedly to our councils especially as oakes knew that he held the keys to the conviction of the assassin the witness oakes in his fluent style acquainted the chief with the fact that the negro was already under surveillance and that in his opinion he should be brought to mona for further examination yes but certainly we must smuggle him in as it would be unwise to let the populace know we have him now they might infer he was the murderer and violence would certainly be done him at present i have all i can do to keep order in the town said holland then he gave a lucid account of the wave of suspicion and of the evidences of nervous tension the citizens were showing why he said almost every man suspects his neighbor lifelong friends are suspicious of one another and business is nearly at a standstill one man looked at another in absent-minded sort of way to-day and the other retaliated with a blow and an oath and asked him if he would look at his own arms not his neighbors yes said oakes we have a great mental emotion suspicion to deal with which might amount to a public calamity unless checked one must always take account of the actions and reasonings of communities emotional waves rush through them as through individuals sometimes look at history and consider the waves of religion emotional in character that have occurred look at the unreasonableness developed in our own country from ignorance and fear when witches were being burned at the stake oakes said moore with a smile you seem to make mental processes and conditions as much a study as a physician does certainly oakes replied it is most important did we not study the workings of a criminal mind for instance we would be often baffled you see the determination of the probable condition of such a one's mind is often paramount especially in such a case as this in other words was the motive one that would naturally sway an ordinary healthy individual under the conditions appertaining to the crime the so-called sane motive or was it in any way dependent upon particularities of the criminal's reasoning a motive built up of something unreal 
a delusion in the mind of one not in his right senses i myself had frequently had cause to study such mental process in the practice of my profession but i was amazed at the knowledge shown by oakes and stated in such a broad untechnical manner the man was no ordinary one to be sure but i had scarcely expected him to show such education in these matters i now recall what moore had once told me of oak's all-round attainments dr moore broke the silence you are a lalapalooza oaks oaks did not notice the remark but said i don't know what other men do but i have tried to bear in mind such things yes said Holland and consequently there is only one quintus oakes it seems to me continued holland that your work here at the mansion will soon lead to results and i trust that you will find time to consider the murder also gentlemen said oakes very seriously from what i saw after the mark murder in town from what you report i feel that mona is in a very serious plight i shall make time holland to do what little i can and thus quintus oakes became the leader in the unravelling of the mark murder mystery after a few remarks of no particular consequence and a more or less general conversation he resumed suppose chief that we now smuggle the negro into mona as soon as possible and bring him here i believe that if mr elliot goes back with martin and they explain things to the boy he will come without much trouble it must be impressed upon him that he is regarded in the light of a hero appeal to the innate weakness of the race desire for flattery i believe we can bring him here easily said elliot for he has confidence in me if he refuses to come said holland we can get him here in plenty of ways yes said oakes martin knows how leave it to him only we must have him soon and he must come here by way of another station incognito lest the people become too excited this being agreed upon the conversation became more general and in answer to questions we found that oakes had not yet formulated any solution to the mystery of the identity of the murderer as he said the affairs of downstairs might be connected with the murder indirectly or directly but as yet we had not had sufficient opportunities for studying the surroundings of the house or the life of its attaches to venture an opinion he laid particular stress upon the fact that opinion should never be formed on poor evidence such a biased mind was incapable of appreciating new discoveries or new clues to theorize too much was very easy but sometimes fatal to detection of crime he preferred to work along several lines of investigation before concentration on any one idea the affair of last night in my estimation he said is one of very grave import unquestionably from what you saw stone and from the evidence of us all there were two men near the place you were going to pass that the first one warned you was in a sense a friend is mysterious enough it needs solution but that man who warned you should have run away and been pursued by the other is peculiar to say the least the signs of your companions were heard by the man at the bridge undoubtedly and he ran to escape detection himself the other the one on this side who is a probable assassin would under ordinary circumstances have run away when he saw you were warned he did run but it was after the man who warned you to my mind the explanation is this continued the detective the man at the bridge is friendly but cannot expose his identity or risk capture the would-be assassin was convinced that the man who warned you knew of his purpose therefore pursued him to finish him in self protection i don't see why said moore he could have escaped instead exactly said oakes he could have done so but he did not wish it 
he has not completed what he wants to do around here he wished to come back and to do so with safety he must rid himself of the one who knew of his doings looks as though he was planning more trouble he may have been the man of robe or the man with the arms i ventured or both said oakes at all events said holland i wish we could divert the minds of the people in the town the tension is great too great for safety perhaps chief said oakes that you and i can arrange a little matter that will distract their attention and which will tend to make them believe that progress is being made he laughed as he spoke and we knew he was thinking over some little scheme to help holland back into popular favor end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of quintos oaks a detective story this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by gabby cowan quintos oaks a detective story by charles ross jackson chapter fourteen clues the carpenters and masons came and went in a very business-like way all that morning while we were closeted upstairs with our companion and chief hallen after he left us moore and i walked down to the gate and around the grounds leaving oakes to attend to details with martin carpenters were very busy around the dining-room carrying in boards and implements and examining the woodwork and the balcony a few of the masons were about the grounds engaged on small details and all seemed to be on good terms with cook and his wife and annie mike was busy at one end of the garden and maloney was not far off this stone is to be a day of events here but things are being done very quietly are they not you could suspect nothing out of the way far less a hunt for a murderer or the investigation of a mystery would you no were i not informed i should think that oakes had merely a gang of laborers at work he has that but he has also a body of the best detectives for the purpose to be had maloney and mike are puzzling him considerably stone they are very close to one another always and seem quite intimate yes i replied i have noticed it they both show a great deal of interest in these alterations have you noticed how maloney is watching o'brien he keeps him continually in sight we had approached the front door of the mansion as we spoke oakes was standing just outside his eyes likewise upon the two gardeners our last remarks were made in his presence and he entered the conversation with a quiet observation to the effect that maloney seemed to fear that mike might not attend to his business but that mike would nevertheless i was obliged to acknowledge that i did not understand oh mike is a good laborer he explained he needs not such watching and there seemed to be a peculiar significance in the words they were stated in a slow indifferent manner that caused me to look at the speaker but his face wore the inscrutable expression which i had frequently seen before and i learned nothing i knew him well enough by this time however to realize that something was taking shape in his thoughts now let's go inside said he after lunch we will attack the final solution of the manner in which these mysterious assaults were performed like all such things it will be simple enough i know and the point remaining to determine will be not how it was done but by whom 
i feel confident that the door in the cellar room leads upward to an interface which communicates with the dining room through panels in the walls the peculiar noise the swish that i heard resembled the sudden sliding of a board and it was the conviction that the person who assaulted moore disappeared into the wall which made me run downstairs i felt sure there would be some explanation of it below that afternoon a systematic search of the entire house was made the cellar room in which the assault upon oaks had occurred was thoroughly lighted and examined the heap of rubbish which mike had been investigating at our previous visit proved to be composed of plaster and bricks the wall in which the door was cut was found to be about three feet thick and one of the foundations of the house it was solid save for a chimney-like opening which had been trapped with the door above at the level of the dining-room floor the great wall ceased from one edge was continued upwards the original partition between that room and the next the parlor but it was thin and had evidently been recently straightened by another wall slightly thicker and built from the opposite edge of the foundation leaving a space between the two into this space entered at a certain point the opening from the cellar room below it was a peculiar arrangement as oakes remarked the new wall had been made with no regard to the economizing of space for had it been built immediately back of the old considerable room would have been saved for the parlor one of the carpenters thought that the original idea had been to utilize the space for closets the only other possible use for it so far as we would discover was the one which oakes had surmised ventilation for the cellar still to our ordinary minds a chimney would have answered that purpose quite as well a little further investigation however showed the top of the foundation wall to be covered with cement well smooth and the walls themselves were plastered it was generally conceded therefore that the first idea had been to use it as a closet room which could easily have been done by cutting doors through the walls as oak said the notion had evidently met with opposition and had been abandoned so communication had been made with the cellar instead and the roof opened to afford ventilation the opening into the cellar was large a man could easily enter it and standing reach the top of the foundation wall then by a little exertion he could raise himself into the intermural space oakes moore and i proved this by actual experiment and found that the passage was quite wide enough to accommodate a man of average proportions i have said that the dining-room was finished in oak panels these had been reached from our side of the wall by removing the bricks and mortar the same stuff evidently which helped to form the rubbish heap in the room below one of the larger panels had been made to slide vertically it had been neatly done and had escaped detection from the dining-room because of the overlapping of the other panels some debris still remained between the walls the fellow we are after knew of the space between the walls and worked at the panel after the repairs were completed was oakes remark how do you know that asked moore oakes looked at him and smiled then said moore what is your reasoning ability do you think if the panel had been tempered with 
at the time of the repairs were made that the debris would have been left behind no it would have been removed with the rest of the dirt we had gone to our rooms upstairs while the men were hunting through the tunnel to the well they found nothing everything was as we had left it after our adventures there it seemed to us that all things considered the work on the panel must have been done by someone within the household or at least that some of its members must have been involved in the matter it may have been accomplished at night however and by an outsider said oakes the servants quarters are separate from the house anyone might easily have entered the cellar by the tunnel route still there may have been collusion also it seems a nonsensical idea to leave the debris in the cellar i said no i think not was the answer the caretakers are afraid even to enter that place the miscreant knew that the detection would be probably at the hands of strangers only that evening elliot and martin left for new york they were to bring the negro boy joe to mona late at night before we retired oakes asked us to go with him into the parlor what for said i to forge another link in the chain the strongest yet he said what do you remember the cartridge i found in the cellar yes yes but you did not pay much attention to it i thought he looked gravely at me stone that cartridge probably corresponds in calibre to the one which was used in the murder of mark ah said moore i had a notion of that myself why did you not tell us your opinion before because when i found it we were working on the mansion affair only i divined the value of the find but why should i have mentioned it i was not hunting the mark murderer then quintus you consummate fox you work howling well not at all business is business what is the use of gossiping there are no ladies to be entertained in my profession doctor he led the way to the parlor we meekly following to where a cluster of arms hung up the wall one of those ornaments of crossed swords guns and a shield so common in old houses he remarked that he had noticed these arms on his previous visit he looked at a revolver hanging across the shield with a pouch beneath it and then suddenly in surprise said last time i was here a few weeks ago there was a large old-fashioned revolver here of forty four or forty five caliber i remember it well being interested in firearms this one now here is of a similar pattern and appearance but of a smaller caliber and newer look the cartridges in this pouch are of about forty-five size they belong to the old weapon and cannot be used with this one again some of them are missing there were at least a dozen before now there are only three or four the old revolver and some cartridges have been taken away and a newer weapon substituted indeed but why said moore sceptically partly because an oaks was decisive kurt master of the situation because this one cannot be loaded see he then tried to turn the chamber and showed us that the mechanism was faulty the old revolver said he in a low tone and some cartridges were taken away and in order that its absence should be less noticeable this one was left here it being useless now boys the cartridge i found downstairs on the cellar floor is a forty five caliber and belongs to those of the pouch and the original revolver as you see 
he took it from his pocket and showed us that it did not fit the weapon in his hand but matched the cartridges in the pouch it belonged to the old weapon we are closing in said i yes the man of the rope has the old revolver and cartridges he took them within the last few days finding his own weapon out of order it is he who is responsible for the mystery in this house and in all probability it is he who shot winthrop mark you remember the evidence at the inquest showed that a heavy revolver had been used a forty four or forty five caliber exactly such as one as the old weapon which i saw here excellent oaks remarked moore there is only one objection yes i know said oaks you were going to ask why the fellow did not take all these cartridges and put his own in the pouch to match the weapon he left here exactly said moore well said the detective he either had no cartridges of his own handy or else like all criminals however smart he tripped the brain of no man is capable of adjusting his action precisely in every detail guess you're right no man can be perfect in his reasoning and no matter how clever the criminal he is almost certain to make an error sooner or later said moore yes but it takes peculiar power to discover it i chirped the events of the day had tired me and my mind was growing confused i desired to go to bed oakes smiled slightly no stone it takes a study worry and patient reasoning to discover the faulty link in a clever criminal's logic that is why there is a profession like mine i was half asleep but i heard him continue we may consider we have excellent cause to look for a man who has in his possession an ancient revolver and some very old dirty cartridges covered with verdigris like this here murder will out i interpolated yes eventually sometimes however it is easy to say he who had that revolver did the murder but as it may have been destroyed since then or thrown into the river it is another thing to find a man we were crestfallen oakes himself looked wearied i wish the whole mansion was in the river and there were a decent cafe round here protested moore you're a vigorous pair of assistants i must say said quintos i have some samples in my room come and we all adjourned end of chapter fourteen read by gabby cowan fifteen of quintos oaks a detective story this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gabby Cowan. Quintos Oaks, a detective story. By Charles Ross Jackson. Chapter 15. The Ruse. After all, however, the doctor and I decided to spend the night at the hotel and acquire any information that we could as to occurrences in town we chose to walk along the river road to the corners keeping ourselves on the alert for any treachery the night was cool and bracing and the sky cloudless as we yearned the moon rose throwing its rays athwart the tangled outline of the wood the great high trees were just beginning to drop their leaves occasionally a woody giant separated from the rest would fix our attention standing silhouetted against the background of forest majestic alone like a sentinel guarding the thousands in column behind an occasional flutter 
of a night bird or the falling and rustling of the dead leaves was all that we heard as we walked rapidly the mile to the corners as we were about to round into the highway and leave the forest of the estate behind us moore grasped my arm and led me to the deep shadow of a tree by the roadside hark that sounds peculiar he said we listened and heard a thumping sound repeated at intervals an uneasy horse standing somewhere in the woods hereabouts said i yes what is he doing there at this time of the night and in these particular woods we consulted together and waited then having satisfied ourselves that the noise came from the woods of the state near the crest of the hill we decided to investigate as quickly as possible and enter the forest stealthily and with but little noise unused to the life of the woods we doubtless made more rustling than was necessary but we were favoured by the fact that the trees were not very close together and in consequence the carpet of dead leaves was not thick halting behind the trunks of trees occasionally we listened for the sound which came from further within the wood soon we came to an opening a glade perhaps two hundred feet from the road the moonlight fell upon the far side but on the side next us all was shadow dark and sombre we stood well within it among the trees i fancied i heard a horse whinny the animal was certainly restive I saw the doctor take out his revolver and lie carefully down behind a tree. I remained standing. We both waited. We were within a few feet of one another, but did not speak. Suddenly, on the far side, we saw a figure walking towards the shade and heard him say a few words to the horse. Quickly he led the animal away into what appeared to be a path moore whispered to me watch the road he is going there we retraced our steps and soon saw the horse appear on the edge of the wood he was a large powerful animal and seemed to act as though he understood what was expected of him the man was still leading the horse but was now also speaking in a low voice to someone else who disappeared toward the town and came out on the highway further down walking rapidly toward the village as any belated citizen might see sí, said moore he brought the horse and is going back watch the rider the latter had been standing in the shade looking after the man who had gone when suddenly seeming satisfied that he was not watched he bolted into the saddle he came out into the moonlight in a second or two and rode rapidly up river road past the corners and northward away from the town we had managed to get near the road and as he dashed into the open we saw that he held the reins with the left hand his right resting on the horse's neck and in it as we both recognized a revolver a splendid rider was my remark yes said moore did you recognize him it was mike i thought yes mike it was and acting in a very suspicious manner he has done this before evidently knew the road and the horse and was on the lookout for trouble for he was armed we decided to follow the first man it being useless to attempt to overtake the rider taking the darkest side of the road we walked on after the figure in the distance soon my companion's spirits began to rise and we laughed at our adventure as he called it stone i cannot help thinking that you and i are destined to become great sleuths we have been away from the mansion only a short half an hour and already have detected a man on horseback who is carrying a revolver and have identified him as mike 
yes we're improving but why did you lie down behind that tree afraid no answered moore with a laugh i have been studying caution i want to see broadway again then he continued stone this adventure is becoming more and more complicated and occasionally i wonder if i was not foolish in coming here it is so different from practising surgery this being assaulted by invisible foes seeing victims of murder and things like that to say nothing of men chasing one another by moonlight he was half serious and i acknowledged that the affair was rather nerve-wearing then we looked ahead and suddenly realized that the figure we were following had vanished moore gasped in astonishment hang it all we certainly are a pair of apes to let that fellow get away won't oakes be disgusted yes and he will have good cause the lesson was a needful but costly one thenceforth when on business we cease to discuss our feelings and endeavour to use our eyes and ears more and our tongues less we received a cordial welcome from the people at the hotel and gossiped around the corridor for some time the crowd outside was sullen but within the atmosphere seemed less strained we learned that chief hallen had made several arrests that afternoon a measure which had had a sovereign effect the saloons had been warned not to abuse their privileges many persons spoke of the work done by hallen as excellent indeed we were both impressed by the fact that the sentiment toward him of the better citizens was friendly considerable disgust was expressed however privately of course at the lack of evidence so far bearing upon the murder itself in the course of the evening we managed to see riley the porter and he pointed out several men to us these fellows are new in town they must be detectives if they discover things well and good but if they don't the people here won't stand it they will resent what they call outside work hallen must have gone in for business said i riley grew confidential no it ain't hallen they say there is a lot of talk about some new york man coming up here to run things who oh they say that quintos oaks you've heard of him of course is coming soon and these are some of his men indeed and moore and i exchanged glances but say continued the porter that is confidential only we fellows round here know it we parted from riley and moore said if they know about it in here of course half of the town has heard already yes the tale was doubtless started by hallen as a great secret he knew it would spread evidently oakes has not been recognized by the people as yet no i rejoined but the fact that the rumor is out shows to my mind that hallen and oakes have some little scheme on hand at any rate we must know nothing of oakes remember that he is clark to all but a select few we decided to go to one of the newspaper offices after a brief call of chief hallen who gave us no news of value but was nevertheless very agreeable he advised us to see dowd and gave us a note to him we found the newspaper man at his office just finishing his night's work he was very attentive in furnishing us back copies of his rival's paper the daily news he said he kept them filed as samples of daring journalism i have only been a couple of years in this business but i have the pedigree of the town in these newspapers i got them from people who had saved them as country people will 
Skinner would not sell me any, the rascal. Whenever he grows fresh and criticizes things improperly, I investigate what he has previously said on the subject, and then published a deadly parallel column. He has a rather poor memory, and I worry him once in a while. He remarked with a laugh. We found the paper which corresponded in date to the piece we had taken from the robe. There was a full account of the murder of Smith, which we read, but nothing that seemed to us of any value. On that occasion no clues whatever had been found. Only, again, the local physicians had thought the wound was made by a large bull. The old chief at that time had been succeeded by Hallen, who had never been able to gain any definite clue to the murderer. The interest had then died out, and the mystery became a thing of the past. Doubt discussed the similarity of the recent murder to that of Smith, and hinted, moreover, that he knew the identity of our friend Clark. He said Hallen had made a confidant of him as he might want to make use of his newspaper. By the way, speaking of the old murder, there is something that has never been published, but which some of the old codgers about here have cherished as perhaps relating to it. What is it? asked the doctor. Well, a couple of old men who have since died, both milkmen, used to say that once or twice they had seen a woman near the scene of the murder at that hour in the morning, also that she always ran into the woods and was dressed in black. Who were those old men? Well, they were both reliable fellows. Their tales were laughed at, so they refused to discuss the matter any more. They both claimed to have seen her at a distance, however, and since they were on different wagons, their stories seemed to corroborate each other. We expressed our great interest in the news, and Dowd advised us to see Riley the porter, who had heard the story of the woman from the men themselves. We returned to the hotel, feeling much elated at the courtesy of Dowd, and at the prospect of learning something not generally known and bearing upon the murder soon we managed to find riley he came to our rooms on the excuse that we had some orders to give concerning baggage that had not yet arrived from new york the porter was decidedly intelligent having been reduced to his present position through adversity as we already knew it took only a little questioning to elicit his story which he told about as follows you see, gentlemen, about the time of Smith's murder, the milkmen were in the habit of watering their horses at an old fountain just by our curb, but since done away with. Well, about two weeks before Smith was murdered, one of the milkmen, Moses Inkelman, a driver for a large farm north of here, told me that he had that morning seen a very large woman on the crest of the hill as he was driving to town she was seemingly anxious to avoid notice and stepped into the woods as he passed by moses asked me if i thought she was any one from mona he seemed so curious about the matter that several who had heard his story laughed at him he was very sensitive and did not mention the episode again until after the murder long after I remember, and then only to me, when he said, These people would only stop making fun of a Jew, and believe me, they might learn something. He disappeared a little while afterward, and we learned from his successor that he had suddenly died of heart disease on the farm. The other milkman never told his story save to a few one night around the stove in a grocery store the others were inclined to scoff at him 
but i remember what moses had told me and saw this fellow sullivan alone it was about a year after the affair he said that he had seen a woman's figure lurking around the crest of the hill on two different occasions before the murder did he say anything about her appearance i asked no he said he never came very near to her but he saw that she always wore black and ran very heavily he thought she was one of the drunken creatures that sometimes infest the water front on saturday nights you see gentlemen there were more factories here then and the town was tougher than it is now especially along the railroad and shore where the canal boats came in the new piers farther down the river have changed all that sullivan told his story to the police but they saw nothing in it or pretended they didn't so sullivan shut up what became of him moore asked well sir that's the curious part of it to my mind he was found dead only a short time ago on the river road way down near lorona and there were marks on his throat and blood in his mouth the examiner said he had had an hemorrhage and had choked to death scratching himself in his dying struggles but well continue commanded moore gentlemen i believe he was murdered why what makes you think so i asked i saw the body at the undertaker's in lorona gentlemen and the marks on the neck were not only scratches but black and blue patches the examiner was a drunk heart himself and not a good christener i always had the idea that the milkman was choked to death by the woman because he had seen her and the other fellow moses i think he was done away with likewise continued dryly i tell you gentlemen there is more to all this than is perhaps wise to know unless one keeps pretty quiet we tipped riley a good fee and then turned in for the night in a most uncomfortable frame of mind as moore said things are coming up so rapidly here that we will all be twisted before long our visit to the town had so far proved more valuable than we had hoped for and we both wished that oakes could have been with us several times in the night i awoke and each time heard footsteps passing to and fro and subdued voices in the corridor downstairs and could but reflect how very different this was from the usual quietude of such a place when we arose in the morning moore remarked that he never knew of such a noisy hotel in a small town guess the place is going to give me nervous prostration pretty soon if things keep up like this said he while we were at breakfast chief hallen walked in and sat down beside us in a rather pompous manner i thought he seemed desirous of calling attention to himself well gentlemen he said in a quiet enough way don't be taken aback at anything you may witness to-day you may have a surprise i want you to meet me in the hotel corridor soon and see who comes on the nine o'clock train he bade us adieu and walked out in an unnaturally aggressive manner he's showing off like a schoolboy said i or else acting corrected moore we sat down in the corridor by and by hallen was talking with a clerk at the desk the hangers on were numerous and wore an air of expectancy they were waiting for someone the rickety old carriage from the station arrived at this moment and the man on the box opened the door with more than usual courtesy out stepped a medium-sized man of good figure and a most remarkable face it was bronzed like that of a seafaring man the eyes were black as jet and piercing the nose hooked and rather long 
he wore a thick short moustache which matched his hair and eyes in blackness otherwise his face was smooth shaven and his attire was in the perfection of good taste for a business man when he spoke one noticed particularly his strong white even teeth he looks like a pirate from the spanish main dressed up said moore a remarkably attractive fellow anyway yes i said he has the air of a celebrated man of some kind as he walked to the desk the bystanders spoke in subdued tones watching him the while i heard one lounger say sure that is the fellow i've seen him before ain't he a wonder in looks chief hallen advanced and spoke a few words to the stranger and then shook hands with him he registered and the clerk thumped the bell for riley with an air of tremendous importance as though by accident chief hallen spied us and taking the stranger by the arm walked over to us we arose and bowed as the chief repeated our names saying so that those near could hear gentlemen you are from the city let me make you acquainted with one of your fellow citizens mr quintos oakes of new york moore calmly shook hands and mumbled something and then in a side whisper to me said it's up to you stone save something although i was nearly as surprised as he and managed to make a few audible remarks about how glad the town would be to know that quintos oakes was here i saw a merry twinkle in hallen's eyes but the stranger made a suitable reply and left us with that peculiar business-like air of his i turned to moore and half gasped what does this mean old man a decoy said he just keep your nerve hallen has been giving us practice in acting the bystanders and the groups in the street were discussing the stranger with peculiar suppressed excitement many of the smart ones claimed to have seen him before and to know all about him already quintos oaks rang familiarly from their lips we presently returned to the mansion and related to our leader the facts we had learned from riley regarding the woman's appearances before the murder the sudden ending of both the milkman who had seen her and the riley's own suspicions in the matter oakes was thoughtful for quite a while you have done more than i thought you could in so brief a time said he at last have you any theories regarding the identity of the woman we had none to offer and he began to smile ever so slightly well it seems to me your woman is a mistake there was no woman the assassin was a man in a black robe he ran heavily of course you have drawn the murderer of smith nearer to that of mark as regards to the sudden deaths of the milkmen probably both were killed the examinations after death conducted as these were amount to nothing the murderer of smith the two milkmen and of mark is probably one and the same stone you nearly fell a victim at the bridge the other night too i did not reply but a cold perspiration broke out over me the chain of events seemed clearer now in the light of oak's reasoning then he turned to moore doctor loan me your cigar cutter will you the physician reached for it but it was gone i think this must be it said oakes holding out the missing article next time you hide on your stomach behind a tree do it properly moore was dumbfounded what i cried you know that too we did not tell you no you did not you began your narration at the wrong end or perhaps you forgot and his eyes twinkled but how did you learn of it demanded moore recovering and quintus smiled outright 
My man was behind another tree only ten feet away from you the whole time. When you left, he picked up this as a memento of your brilliant detective work. Moore and I smarted a little under the sarcasm, and I asked what the man was doing there. Oh, he was watching Mike and incidentally keeping you two from mischief. You need a guardian. You never even suspected his presence, and suppose he had been the assassin. Well, I said, I suppose that you know all about your namesake in town and don't need any of our information. He heard the chang ring in my voice and smiled as he replied, Don't mind those little things. They happen to all of us. I am glad that Quintos Oaks has arrived. Chief Hallen and I concluded that the sudden arrival of such a man as our decoy would have a salutary effect on the citizens. An appearance of faction on Hallen's part would tend to quiet their restlessness, and now that public attention is focused upon him, Mr. Clark and his friends can work more freely. During the discussion that followed, he told us that Mike's errand on horseback was as yet unknown, but that the man whom we followed and lost on the way was from a stable in Lorona. You see, continued he, Mike has been doing this before. The horse is brought from Lorona in a roundabout way. Doubtless, on his return, he leaves it at some spot where it is met and returned to the stable. Mike is a mystery. What is he up to? said Moore. Can he be the murderer? Wait and see, replied Oakes enigmatically as he ended the conversation. End of chapter 14 Read by Gabby Cowan Sixteen of Quintus Oaks, A Detective Story This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Quintus Oakes, A Detective Story, by Charles Ross Jackson. The Negro's Story. Saturday came and went without event. So far, at least, Hallen's arrangements for the preservation of order had been effective. Or it was that the eyes and the hopes of the people were centered upon the new arrival in town, the great detective, as they were led to believe, who had grown famous through his skill in ferreting out just such mysteries. In any case, the chief's forebodings of a lawless outbreak were unfulfilled. The real oak spent most of his time in the mansion while we remained in town. But our little party came and went as it pleased. Our movements had ceased to attract that attention which Oakes found so undesirable, as he said, in the well-known phrase of the sleight-of-hand operators, the more you look, the less you see. The eyes of Mona were focused on the false Oakes, the wrong hand. We ourselves, the hand doing the trick, were overlooked. And the more absorbed they became in movements of the decoy, the more oblivious they were of the fact that keen eyes were studying them deeply. The criminal, unless very educated and clever, would be fooled with the multitude and caught off his guard. A rather curious fact was that, while Dowd's newspaper published an article in its personal column about the great detective's arrival and all that he was expected to accomplish, Skinner's journal remained absolutely silent. Dowd said he could not understand it, unless the ruse had failed to deceive Skinner, in which case we might hear from him soon. We knew that our friend Quintus Oakes held the same idea. As he said, if the cheat were discovered, it would lead to trouble, which must be met if it arose. Moore and I became daily more imbued with the spirit of the adventure, besides which we were keenly alive to Oakes' feelings and his desire to succeed. The newspapers, far and near, were following the case carefully, and we knew that his reputation and financial success depended largely on the outcome of this case. A few evenings later, Moore and I were standing in the square, 
discussing the very apparent change in the temper of the crowd since their attention had been directed by the arrival of the man they believed to be quintus oakes yes said moore in answer to a remark of mine it is a clever scheme and makes the people think that hallen is doing something but how will they take it if they discover the trick well perhaps by that time the real oakes our friend will be in position to reveal his identity that would calm any bad feeling they would realize that work had been done quietly all the while moore shook his head doubtfully i don't like skinner's attitude he said he knows something riley approached us at this moment to say that clark wanted us at the mansion immediately and that a conveyance was waiting for us at the hotel we went at once and found it a four-seated affair with hallen and dowd on the back seat we two sat in the front with the driver one of oak's men and after we had left the town i turned to the chief and asked him if he knew what oak's wanted of us there yes he said the negro is here oakes was awaiting us upstairs with martin and elliot the first thing we learned was that oakes had recognized the negro joe as a former bootblack on broadway joe's identification of him during the court scene had placed the negro in a state of less fear than would otherwise have been the case he came readily enough said martin but he was threatened with arrest if he did not but he is acting peculiarly seems more worried than an innocent man should be he naturally dreads the ordeal innocent men frequently appear guilty to the onlooker the really guilty ones are prepared to go through more coolly said oakes yes sir i know that but this one is different i should hardly say he is guilty still his actions are peculiar i cannot explain how think a little martin said oakes it was the tone of the superior firm but kindly martin thought a few seconds and he said well sir he seems anxious to describe what he saw he seems to think that you are his friend and will believe him but he appears to be actually fearful of punishment rather ambiguous said oakes perhaps he is hiding some vital point martin is he not yes sir and that point is against himself of course it is or he would not hide it against himself or one dear to him oakes correction was without malice polite and patient he was the clear reasoner the leader instructing a trusty subordinate the kindly chief and his young but able lieutenant we ranged ourselves around the centre table we four who had come in the carriage besides elliot and martin who had brought joe from new york oak stood near a chair away from the table and the group after a moment the negro entered ushered to the door by one of the men we must have looked a formidable conclave to the poor fellow, for he halted just inside the door at the sight of us. He was a negro of that type seen in the north, strong, lithe, with a clear-cut face whose features showed the admixture of white blood. He advanced to the chair beside Oakes, and sat down at a sign from the latter. He was nervous, but a pitiful effort at bravery showed in his carriage and manner. Bravery was necessary a lone negro boy facing such a gathering and worst of all to him that mysterious awe-inspiring person quintus oakes with consummate tact quintus won the boy's confidence elliot spoke to him kindly and reassuringly and hallen walked over and shook his hand with a protecting air joe brightened visibly it was plain that the men who hunted crime were going to try kindness and sympathy first it has always seemed to me a pity that such tactics are not more in vogue, especially toward witnesses. The master detective can throw a sympathy into his every act, which will win secrets actually barred from other methods of attack. Reassured, Joe presently began his story. In a clear, remarkably able way, for he had been to school, and with the peculiar dramatic power possessed by some Negroes, he brought vividly before us the scenes he had witnessed as he warmed to his subject oakes and hallen watched him carefully but without emotion occasionally questioning him adroitly to develop points which seemed to them valuable dowd took notes at oakes suggestion for future use when joe's mother died in troy he went up to attend the funeral 
On his return he stayed a few days in Lorona, a little place already mentioned. It was without railway connections, and lay to the east of Mona along the highway. He had passed through the latter place afoot late at night, and had walked the ten miles to Lorona. His sister lived there in service, also his sweetheart Jenny. Naturally, he did not pass it by. He had left very early one morning to go back to New York, and had cut across country from the highway on the east of Mona, coming around by the hill and the pond in front of the mansion to River Road. He had arrived at the corners in time to see a milkman pick up a gentleman on the road and drive with him into the town. Joe wanted to get back to New York early and begin work, for he had been absent a week. He was to catch the seven o'clock train, so he had abundance of time, as he could tell by the sun. He started down the hill slowly, but took the woods along the north side of the highway. He was fond of the woods, and he knew the way. He had traveled it on previous visits. Just after he entered among the trees, he heard a shot, followed by a groan on the road, he thought, a little way above him. He trembled and stood still. Then his courage manifested itself, and he crept cautiously to the roadside, which was hidden below by a few feet of embankment. What he saw paralyzed him. A man was lying in the road, and a little lower down on this side, not a hundred feet from himself, stood another in full view with a smoking revolver in his hand. Instantly the negro understood. A murder, and he was a witness. He did nothing, waited. To have shouted would have been to invite death. But he kept his eyes open. "'I's the only witness. I must look at him good,' he thought. The man's back was partly turned, but Joe took in all that he could at that distance, and saw him retreat after a moment into the woods. Then he grew frightened. The assassin was not far from him, but fortunately going deeper into the woods and down the stony glade below. Did the negro run? No. He gathered a couple of good-sized stones and followed. He thought the man on the road was dead, and he saw the other one going down into the gully to cross the small stream at the bottom. Good, he thought, I'll follow him. If he sees me now and comes after me, I can run a long way before he can climb that hill. The assassin was picking his way carefully until he came to the rocky bottom. He wanted to cross the stream where a large flat rock gave an invitation for stepping. He had followed the stony formation carefully, avoiding the earth. He did not wish to leave marks to be traced. Now at this moment the negro became conscious of a new danger. He was near the scene of the crime, alone, and if found he would be suspected of having done it. So he looked about for a moment, and then decided to run back to Lorona and his people. He was growing scared. Who could blame him? He saw the murderer stoop down right below him, deep in the gully, and the negro, obeying a sudden impulse, swung one arm and hurled a stone straight at him. It struck the fugitive on the shoulder, turning him half around, and he broke off into a run, full tilt, for the brook and the stepping stone. Joe had not seen the murderer's face, but he told us that the man's chest was protected only by an undershirt. It was a chilly morning, and the fact had impressed him afterwards as curious. He watched and saw the assassin take the brook like a frightened stag, landing first on the rock in the center, then on the other side. As he stepped on the rock in the middle of the stream, the boy saw something fall from his waist, something red. It fell into the water. "'I'd like to know what that is,' he thought, "'but I'd better skip.' Then horror took possession of him. He crossed the road quickly and dashed into the Mark property. Then he ran the river road and the bridge, up the incline to the other side of the pond, and into the fields beyond. On he went until Mona was passed, then he sat down in a little patch of wood and thought. He was sure nobody had seen him except a farmer in the distance, too far away to know that he was a negro. He was innocent, and perhaps he had better wait and see the police. Had he done so then and there, all would have been solved sooner than it was. But, poor boy, he had no one to advise him, and he was alone with a terrible secret. He had done well— he could identify the murderer, perhaps. His was a great responsibility. He stayed around, 
and from afar witnessing the crowds of the morning. In the afternoon he sneaked into town, hungry and worn and terribly cold. When he saw the people gathering in the courtroom, curiosity conquered. He listened with all his soul and made up his mind to go in and tell what he knew. He saw Oakes come forward to give his testimony, and his heart beat fast and furious. He felt ill. The cold sweat poured from him as he heard, but he remained entranced. He was going to tell all, for surely that tall fellow, Clark, they were calling him, was the great detective Oakes. He had shined his shoes many times at the stand on Broadway before he went uptown. How peculiar that they didn't seem to know him. Then intelligence came, and he said to himself, These people don't know him because he does not want them to. Joe did not understand all that had been said, but he knew things were uncanny, and that this man Oakes was playing a game. Suddenly had come the statement of Oakes about the arms, and the tension became too great. He cried out and ran, like a fleet-footed boy that he was, for Lorona. There he told nothing except that he had missed the train. His friends gave him food. The murder story was yet vague in that little village, and then he dashed on for New York. He shook the dust from his clothes, and catching a train miles down the line, arrived safely in town. He was far away from Mona at last, but he must see Mr. Elliot, his good friend, and tell him all that he could. As the negro finished his story, he looked around and partially recovered from the state of ecstasy into which the recitation had thrown him. His eyes were rolling and shifting. His dark skin had that peculiar ashen color that comes to the negro under stress of great excitement. Dr. Moore arose and walked to the boy, and placing his arms on his wrists, said reassuringly, "'Good boy, Joe, you're a brave fellow." Oakes handed him a drink of brandy. He needed it, and then we all joined in praising him. He soon recovered himself, and then Oakes took up his position beside him again. "'Now, Joe, what did the murderer drop when he jumped over the stream from the rock?' "'I don't know, Master Oakes, but it was a banana, I think.' What? said Hallen. A banana? The negro looked worried. Yes, it did look like one of those red, white, spotted cloths what the niggers down south wear on their heads. We all laughed. Oh, a bandana handkerchief, Joe. And Joe laughed, also in relief. And now, continued Oakes, what did it do? Did it float away? The boy thought a moment, then his quick brain came to his aid. "'No, no, Master Oakes, it splashed, show sure enough, it did. "'It went down, so help me gold. "'Good,' said Oakes. "'It contained something heavy. "'Then, now, Joe,' he continued slowly and clearly, "'tell me, when you heard the evidence "'that the murderer was the man with a mark on his arm, "'why did you say, "'Oh, God!' and run away? "'We all felt uneasy. "'The question was so unexpected, to some of us, at least.' The negro hesitated, stammered, and lurched forward in his chair. Great beads of perspiration stood out on his brow and on the back of his hands. Oakes was behind him, and in a caressing way slid his left arm across the boy's chest. We divined instantly that the arm was ready to shoot up around the boy's neck for a stranglehold. Joe tried to speak, but could not. I saw Hallen prepare for a spring, and Martin edge toward the door. Dr. Moore's breathing came fast and loud, and I began to feel like shouting aloud. What did it mean? "'Come, speak, boy, speak,' said Oakes. No answer. Then Oakes stooped forward and said loudly enough for us all to hear, but right in the negro's ear, "'Boy, you ran because you have a scar on your left arm.' We were on our feet in an instant. "'The murderer!' we cried." The negro made a frantic effort to rise, but the arm closed on his neck, and Oak's right hand came down on his right wrist. Joe's left hand went to the arm at his neck, but he was powerless. In a voice as firm as a rock, clear and emotionless, Oakes cried out, "'Don't move, boy. Don't try to run.' And then he said to us, "'This boy is not the murderer. He is only a scared, unfortunate negro.' and I will prove it. 
The meaning of the words came to the boy gradually, and he became limp in the chair. Oakes relaxed his hold. Now, boy, if you try to run, we will bore you. The chief Hallen drew his revolver and put it before him on the table. Now, Joe, show us your arm, commanded Oakes. The negro arose, staggering, and took off his outer garment and his shirt. There on his left arm was a large, irregular birthmark, blue and vicious-looking. Oakes looked at it. "'Gentlemen, this boy is a victim of circumstances. This is no cross, but the coincidence of a mark on the left arm has scared him nearly to death. That, in my opinion, is why he was afraid, and why he acted so peculiarly.' This was said deliberately and with emphasis. The negro fell on his knees. Oh, God! Oh, Mr. Oakes, that is it! That is it! I never done any murder! No, no, no! And he burst into racking sobs. The strain was terrible. Dowd opened a window. Hallen spoke. How are you to prove his innocence, Mr. Oakes, as you said? There was a slight element of doubt in the question. Get up, boy, said Oakes. Get up. And turning to us, the cool man looked long at us, then said, The evidence showed clearly that the weapon used was a heavy one, of forty-five caliber probably, a revolver in all likelihood, and fired from a distance of about one hundred and fifty feet. This means a good shot. Now this boy is right-handed, as you have noticed, but he could not use his right hand to shoot with, for the first two fingers have been amputated near the ends. Plenty of loss to preclude good pistol shooting. To have used such a weapon with the left hand and with such accuracy is out of the question save for a fancy shot. If this boy could shoot like that, he would not be boot blacking for a living. Again, he has not noticeably strong arms nor a wrist powerful enough to handle a heavy weapon properly. The boy is innocent, in my opinion. Oaks, you are a demon, said Hallen. "'Oh, no, I hope not. Only I hate to see mistakes made too often, poor devil.' And Oakes patted the boy on the back. With a pathetic, dog-like expression, sobbing with joy, the befriended negro seized the man's right hand, and kneeling, showered kisses upon it. End of chapter 16 Recording by Kevin Davidson, www.blogordie.com